and everyone. I'd like to call to order the Monday, March 4th Board of Supervisors regular meeting. We could all stand for a pledge of allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that motion if there's no, if there's no agenda items. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Moving into presentations, uh, school board report with uh, Dr. Grimsley. Hey, good afternoon. It's such a nice day. Schools are on spring break, but I couldn't miss this opportunity to speak to you, all you wonderful people. Um, February was a very eventful month, to say the least. Uh, we are very ready for spring to grace the area, as it has seen to today. Our CPS wrapped up its winter sports season with great success. While our basketball season did not result in a state championship this year, our teams played valiantly in the postseason with the following players being named to second team all district, Abigail Atkins, Chloe Jenkins, and Nolan Prince. The following earned first team all district, Summer Shackelford and Andrew Deal. Second team all region was earned by Brooke Atkins and Andrew Deal. And finally, Summer Shackelford also earned first team all region recognition. A great accomplishment for our basketball program this season. Our Scholastic Bowl team also earned great success this month in the state tournament. The team traveled to Jamestown High School, placing third in the state. Congratulations to sophomore Ruth Cassette, who scored an impressive toss-up point total of 1,700 points. Mm -hmm. Congratulations also to senior Najet Rayan for her total 820 points and junior Emma Brown for her total 600 points. Congratulations to Coach Nazer and the whole Scholastic Bowl team. Last month, our CHS celebrated National FFA Week. The week was full of agriculture themed spirit days and culminated with a hilarious fundraiser where four staff members with the most cash in their designated cups had to wrangle Hank the mini pig in a mud pit and transport him safely back to his pen. The four winners were math teacher Sally Shackelford and Scott Stevens, SRO Deputy Chris Eubin, and RCHS Principal Carlos Seward. Deputy Eubin emerged victorious in both rounds, catching Hank and returning him safely to his pen. The fundraiser was enjoyed by all, and Hank received a nice bubble bath afterward, courtesy of the small animal care class. You know how much I love pigs if you see my Facebook. I actually taught one of my pigs to say mama. Okay. No lie. Really? I'll show you the video. <laughs> I sing chicks to sleep, and I taught my pig how to say mama. Last month, the third graders participated and competed in the 2024 Read Bowl, a reading competition between classes and schools from all over the country. In total, our CES third graders read an impressive 123,885 minutes over the course of four weeks. Congratulations to all of them. Seventh graders were able to visit the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond last month as part of their annual civics field trip. They also were able to visit the House Chambers, the Science Museum, and visit with Delegate Webber, who shared his experiences in the political sphere. Students were able to ask questions and were able to get a first-hand first account of how the General Assembly sessions work. <clears throat> Finally, RCHS students leapt into success on Leap Day, becoming inducted into the National Honor Society. 21 students were inducted at its 2024 induction ceremony, which took place in the afternoon amidst family members and the entire student body who were able to join in the celebration and cheer on their peers. Next week on March 12th, just two days before I have the privilege of driving the band to Philadelphia on a school bus, I will be presenting the superintendent's budget to the school board for consideration. Just this weekend, we received some baseline numbers for calculation, so we will be revamping our draft budget throughout the week for presentation at the hearing on the 12th. 
Uh, thank you so much for participating in the joint meeting last month. It really is such a great thing when we can work together to find solutions to these significant community challenges. As always, we thank you for your support and advocacy for the youth and families of Rappahannock County. Um, and I do have a little note here to mention too. I know this was a, um, a topic of concern of the supervisors uh, last year. I think Ms. Smith, you brought this up too, is summer programs for parents. Um, it's been a significant need and a challenge for our summer school uh, having part day funding. We have funding for uh, four hours a day throughout four weeks in June for our summer school program, but that was a barrier. We invited, a, I think, 123 or so families for summer school, but many could not make it, almost half, because of if not full day um, and having childcare and making those commitments. So uh, we are in the process of collaborating with CCLC Headwaters 4H. Uh, to com uh, complete a whole five day a week, full day program all summer long. Uh, so we are really working hard on this. We've uh, received some commitments of funding, grants, and all sorts of things, but we are uh, finalizing and crunching some numbers in the next couple of weeks or so. We've already opened up uh, interest forms for families uh, to see, but this was a huge need. We heard from the parents um, and it's been a great collaboration between all of them. So it'll be just one program. So our summer school will be in all these summer camps that CCLC offers and Headwaters and 4-H are all <coughs> going to be one program. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. We'll see how it goes. It's called Spark. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. What's it stand for? Oh gosh, I have to remember that. <laughs> of arts and recreation knowledge. There's all those pretty terms. Ask Jenny Capso. She's the one that created a lot of this, but she's amazing. That's great news, Shannon. You have any questions for me? Anything? Okay. Um, I, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thanks, thanks for um, the joint meeting and I'm also meeting recently with uh, Chair Donna. And me. Um, I had a question that I asked previously, and I think now maybe it's time to put a finer point on it. And that relates to um, your expected average daily membership mm -hmm. and then the, the potential revenue um, role that I believe the number is 50 something mm -hmm. students who are sort of called non local students who are now in our school system for various reasons their <clears throat> their presence in our school system i understand will drive to some extent state funding of our school system by way of all other things being equal an increase in funding because it increases our average daily membership and so i think as we get close to hearing from you all your bottom line on what you expect to receive from the state and what you will need from um, our general fund and local tax sellers. I think it would be helpful mm -hmm. to just hear one more time what your ADM looks like and sure. what those um, non-resident students mean in terms of additional revenue um, from the state for our school system. Sure. So uh, right now our total pre-K through 12 enrollment is 792. So that's up from previous years. Uh, the state is projecting us at an ADM of 728 for next year's budget, although with the 792 enrollment numbers, if you deduct out preschool age students, we're probably looking closer to like 735, 740. But we won't know that till March 31st. Um, ADM gets locked in, um, yeah, March 31st, so we'll know uh, a better plan for that. As far as your non-residents, every year they have to apply for slots for the next year. We wait for ADM, we lock in class sizes, and if there's not room in certain class sizes, they're <clears throat> not able to come and they have to meet certain criteria to stay. Uh, the benefit of that is you're filling in seats that were empty before, and now you're plugging those in that come with about 6,000 extra state dollars every time you do that, so that's why that's helpful. <laughs> Okay, so, and I think the the corollary question I asked last time we talked about this was the extent to which the revenue associated with those additional members in our school system would outpace or outstrip the related expenses That's for nice. those students being in the system. That'd be nice. So uh, you've seen a lot of what's happened in Richmond in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, well, there's lots of additional costs through mandates and initiatives without dealing first with the 
the funding formula, which is something we've been dealing with for a while. Uh, so that would be true had a lot of these provisions not taken place within this General Assembly session. Over 40 bills, new bills, that have associated costs were put through the General Assembly. So for instance, here are just a few that impact our own budget here. So the raises, of course, is a big one I always bring up because that's the biggest one. You have so many staff members, you have to apply that percentage. The cost is really high. You get 17% from the state to do that. So a 10% increase in two years costs you a million dollars and the state will only pay 17% of that. And that makes it very difficult for us to keep up with those types of mandated increases. Another one is the uh, changing ratios with staffing. So they may say you need so many staff for this many students. They did that um, and the counselor provision is changing. So now where we only, it says we need two counselors, this will change it to three. Um, that's another whole person. So <laughs> the salary, you look at a $65,000 salary package with benefits and everything, that's a lot of money, one position. Another one, else teachers are changing. That ratio is changing based on your English language proficiency levels. So that can change year to year. So this year I need, I have a one teacher and an aide for, to serve all those students. But if I have more level one students, I may have to hire another whole teacher just based on their level of uh, English language proficiency. Another one, out of nowhere um, for the Virginia Literacy Act uh, implementation. Great stuff, really is. And they did give us some set aside money to get all the training done and get some resources. Uh, but all of a sudden now we can't use Title I money to support our reading specialists. That paid 100% of our reading specialists. So now we have to pull that into the local budget, but you have to have one but before it was federally funded. So that's just three that I mentioned here that, that uh, affect us. So uh, those are the types of things. And based on the bottom line in the House budget, um, their proposal, we're getting less money than we did this year to do all that <laughs> from the state. It's kind of criminal, don't you think? <laughs> and then the last big picture question, which I, which I talked to you about the other day and it just suddenly struck me, um, is it reasonable to say that all things being equal, your annual operating budget is somewhere, just call it uh, maybe $14 million. Mm -hmm. And all in, the state contribution to that operating budget is $5 million, which, or- Three and a half. Three and a half, <laughs> plus other federal and yeah. additional mm -hmm. money, lunch money. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to understand mm -hmm. that the state funding question um, when you look at it in terms of bottom line numbers, mm -hmm. if it's three and a half or if you add in all the other federal and additional one, school lunch money, mm -hmm. you're at best getting up to $5 million yeah. of a $14 million operating budget Correct. for the school system. Right. And um, I think when you think about how little that is in the grand scheme of things yeah. flowing into the county, we can understand the challenge that, that we face every year. Yeah, and it's just compounding each year, it seems, and that's why we really have to work together for, to find some type of a solution for that, so. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Grimsley, I, I know we had this conversation last year, and mm -hmm. it was a tougher year to make progress, and we had a good feeling this year about that $1.5 being yeah. in the governor's budget from the get-go mm -hmm. and that might put us in a better position mm -hmm. than uh, what we are now um, what can we do to help you get that money back in the budget uh, so the conferees are meeting this week uh, I think the next step is to if we can communicate with them I mean we've been reaching out to everybody we can doing the Richmond visits sending letters face-to-face -face meetings um, but the conferees are meeting behind closed doors this week Thursday, they may present a, a new General Assembly budget to uh, send off to the governor. So maybe we can reach them <laughs> and keep contacting about, uh, you know, the situation here in Rappahannock. It is so anomalous compared to just about everybody else. So it's really tough when we have so few residents, so few votes in Richmond to be able to make this case. But I think the more they hear from us, you know, I think that's the best we can do. Yeah. The, the quote in the paper was really alarming to for someone just to say, well, the, the solution to Rappahannock's problem is that they need to raise their taxes. Yes. And, um, you know, that's, that's not going to sit well in this county, especially when you consider that the issues caused by a cap that is just plain unfair and unjust. Absolutely. So um, whatever we can do to help you 
Thank you. Please let us know. Mm -hmm. And thank you for fighting the good fight for our kids. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if the board would allow me, I would like to take a few minutes and express my frustration over what is happening in Richmond, as it appears it will have a serious negative impact on our county's budget. Our citizens have long bemoaned the effects of Virginia's local composite, composite <clears throat> index, the so-called LCI, which places an unfair limit on our supplemental school funding aid from the state. I say unfair because Rappahannock County is one of only a couple of counties across the entirety of Virginia that suffer financially from the impact of LCI calculations on our rural agricultural economy. The unfairness of the LCI cap on state support caused our delegate, Michael Weber, to lead an effort to remove that cap last year. His effort received bipartisan support and 100% of House Democrats and Republicans supported his bill removing that cap. The bill was put on hold while a study was done and that study demonstrated the bipartisan support was clearly warranted. Our funding in Rappahannock County is behind both national and regional averages and our neighboring state, West Virginia, is funding their schools at a 25% higher rate. For inexplicable reasons, now that Democrats have the majority in our legislature, they no longer support fixing the effect of the LCI cap. This year, new additional mandates are being imposed across the board on Virginia schools. Again, Richmond is not differentiating between the needs of the vast majority of Virginia counties and those of our smaller, rural, relatively low enrollment schools in Rappahannock. By way of example, we have only one elementary school for K through seven and only one high school, eight to 12, with a total of approximately 740 students. Yet the new mandates require us, among other things, to add counseling services as though we had multiple schoolhouses and thousands of students. What is clear to me based on the speeches given in Richmond is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the school funding formula works for those of us in low density rural counties. Lip service is given to the value of our agriculture and the system Governor Yonkin calls putting students first. Yet there's apparently no willingness to help individualize the new education mandates or to compensate for LCI caps that are not fair. One size does not fit every county. While the intent to improve education may be laudable, Breaking the bank for a small rural county making its way on agriculture and tourism is not a laudable result. We simply cannot abide by Richmond's big mandated payroll increases, apparently an attempt to compensate for years of ignoring these issues or requiring the addition of professional positions without assessing our need for them especially when it is clear our formula must be updated to help us deal with these significant additions. Creating the budget is neither fun nor easy, but I ask that all in Richmond do one simple thing. Act on the reality you recognized last year, and that was demonstrated by the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee report, and add our supplemental aid back into the budget to put Rappahannock on equal footing with other counties sharing our demographics. Please allow us, particularly in light of broad new educational mandates, to fulfill our obligations to ensure a quality, caring, nurturing education for our county's children. Rappahannock County and its citizens decided a long time ago to, he to keep Rappahannock rural and scenic focusing on agriculture and tourism. We are proud of this decision, in part because we know we provide both protection and a gateway for one of the nation's most posh, popular national parks. We make some sacrifices for this role, but it shouldn't work as a detriment to the quality of education we can offer our kids. Thank you for indulging me. Well, I think we ought to put that in a letter with our county seal at the top and I'll sign it and send it. I'm happy to do that. And 
Do we need a motion to do that? No. Uh, if you want to authorize her to speak on behalf of the board, it would be wise. I would uh, make a motion to authorize uh, the, the letter that was just read out loud to be put on stationery with the county seal and to be sent to anyone on upon whom it may have a positive effect in Richmond. And uh, I would suggest that uh, to make that a united front, all of the members of the board sign the letter and send it. A second. A second okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I just add FedEx a copy to Delegate Russell. Yes. Hand delivered. No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're now on to the company four report. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, the calls. There were 11 EMS calls in February, and we did not respond on seven of them. We got out on one, and our scorekeeper said that there were dispatcher errors on three. I've asked what that means, and I haven't heard. Our, our county's super dispatcher is on vacation, and so I don't have numbers from her. There were four fire calls, and we got out on one and um, didn't respond on three. So this is uh, Chief Nick's operations report. Uh, he's sorry he can't be here, but work takes him away from our area often. The EMT class has begun, and all seven that were in the EMR classes are enrolled and doing well. More drivers have been released to operate the utility and the ambulance, including me, so beware. Um, three new members have signed up to attend the EVOC class this month in Amosville. And we currently have a prospective member working with County Recruitment Retention who is a, a paramedic firefighter from another state um, and was a flight nurse, uh, just a super candidate. Um, and uh, also trained in and worked in technical rescue. Uh, and she lives in our first due area. Fundraising committee has scheduled a dance on March the 23rd, and we're hoping to raise a little more money. Anything? Questions? Thank you very much for you. continuing Thanks. your updates. Thank you. All right. Um, wrap at home. We have the tour. Oh, Joyce. Okay. Joyce is first. Yes, ma'am. I'm Joyce Wenger, president of Wrap at Home. Thank you very much for having Victoria and I come today to speak about Wrap at Home. We are the largest nonprofit service organization for older adults in the county. We help to meet the needs, the myriad needs, of an aging population in a rural area with limited services and in an area where our population of older adults is growing. Our mission is to serve the health, safety, and social needs of older adults in this county so that we can all live independently in the homes we treasure and near the friends that we cherish for as long as possible. To do this, we provide numerous services and programs. They are designed for everyone, regardless of our backgrounds or our financial situations, we all need various kinds of support at various times in our lives as we are aging. Rapid Home is organized around volunteers for all of us to help each other. It's sort of the neighbors helping neighbors concept, and that is really turning into all of us becoming better friends and now friends helping friends. We, have a lot, we are a large organization. Our budget is $320,000. We have 650 members at this point, and we manage a business this size with a very strong board, with wonderful, wonderful volunteers, and with extremely qualified staff. I want to now introduce Victoria Lang. She's our executive director. She began her career as a psychiatric nurse, and then she moved into the corporate world. So she has the perfect background for running this organization for seniors. She's going to tell you a little bit more about some of the actual things that Rapid Home does to help all of us older adults in the county. Thank you. Victoria? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, this is my first one of these, so if I screw up, forgive me, okay? <laughs> but I do want to stress a couple of things that Joyce said. 
first thing I want to stress is in 2015, we were formed on the village model, and that is neighbors helping neighbors. We are one of the few non-fee rural-based villages. We live on grants and donations, which means that huge budget that Joyce just put out to you guys, we have to go out and get every single year. In the nine years since we've been formed, we have grown from 50 members to 650 members, which is 30% of the senior population in Rappahannock County. That's huge. We have 80 volunteers, and thank God we have 80 volunteers, and we need more, um, who supply critical help. That's help in transportation back and forth to medical appointments, the picking up and delivery of groceries and prescriptions. They help ward off isolation and loneliness through friendly visits and phone calls. The services, the services we have provided in the last year, our transportation committee, our transportation volunteers did over 600, gave over 600 rides last year. 130 some were wheelchair rides. I'd like to remind you that Rap at Home is the only one in the county that has wheelchair available vans. We have two of them and they are constantly in use. We have caregivers and what I mean by caregivers is we have a list of certified nursing, nursing assistants that have been vetted and had background checks by us that we supply to friends or the relatives of friends who call in and say, I need a little extra help over here. We need somebody to come in at night to take care of my father. So this is a list that they can get from us and our, these are people that they provide. Um, we have the Wrap at the Door program. Wrap at the Door was started during COVID. It was a program where we were talking through screens to our somewhat more isolated friends or those that we knew were having mobility issues. This has grown into a monthly program where we take a kindness gift and what that kindness gift can be is it last um, in February, it was a wonderful Valentine's card that was done by the um, after school kids at Headwaters. It had hot chocolate and two cookies. We don't necessarily go for the gift, we go for the visit. I get wonderful feedback from our drivers back saying I was invited in for tea. And I mean, it's, it's a wonderful experience. We do friendly visits, and this can be a weekly or monthly visit that one of our volunteers do to a friend that has reached out and said, I just need a little more socialization. Um, or they, it can be a phone call or a card that is sent. We have our Ready or Not, which is one of our newer programs, and it's a contingency-based program. And I'm not talking about financial contingency. I'm talking about the questions that you don't really want to ask yourselves when you retire. Can we stay here if I die? Can we stay here if you die? What happens if I end up in a wheelchair? Are we prepared for that? What if you get dementia? These are all questions none of us want to ask ourselves, but for to stay in the homes that we are in or to know when it's time to move on, we need to put those plans in place. We also have safety programs. We have, we have and install the guardian alerts, and that's the help I can't get up button that you push. Um, we install those for free. We provide those for free. We work with the Castleton Fire Department for the 9-11 blue signs that you see all over the county. We have somebody that goes out and installs those. We also do that for free for our seniors. We also do very minor house repairs. When we have the luxury of our volunteers going out and visiting people's homes, we can see when maybe your railing's not as tight as it should be. Your stairs may need to be replaced. And depending upon their fiscal situation, that's either something that we can help them find a carpenter to do or we can refer them to the benevolent fund. We have um, activities. We have at least a dozen um, social and educational activities a month. And examples of these can be potlucks, which everybody really likes. Um, we also have speakers come in. We had a wonderful doctor from Valley Health come in last month and talk about advanced directives. Currently, right now, I just got an email from the library. They have a full house. Um, we have a geology lecture going on that um, is, 
I, I, there's probably 50 some odd people there right now. It's, it's wonderful. Um, we also have things that happen weekly and monthly. We have a weekly walk and talk. We have a weekly stitch and bitch, which my mother does. So don't blame me. Um, we have monthly uh, grieving support group. We have a monthly conversations on aging group. And that's just to name a very few. Um, every interaction, we feel every interaction at Rapid Home is an opportunity to form a connection, to deepen a bond, and to establish long friendships. Together, we can create a county where older adults of all backgrounds and economic means can age in place with the support of a caring community. We are stronger together. We collaborate with the nonprofits and the government agencies. Examples would be the Benevolent Fund, the Food Pantry, Encompass, the Senior Center, the Rappahannock, Rapidan Regional Commission, and the school system. And I'm sure I've left somebody out, so forgive me. All serving aging adults only strengthen the social net that we currently have. I'd like, if I have a few minutes, to give you an example of how this collaboration has impacted at least one of the seniors in the county. We're going to call her Jane Doe because it's obviously a made-up name. DSS had been working, that's the one I left out, Division of Social <laughs> Services. DSS had been working with this particular woman for a couple of weeks. She knew she needed to go to the doctor. She hadn't had a medical appointment in years because she just couldn't get there because of her medical issues. God bless DSS. They worked with her. They worked with her. We had, she needed a wheelchair van. We had one of our wheelchair drivers go over with DSS because they, she had established a trust, introduced the driver. We got her in the van. We got her to her medical appointment. We went back and forth to several medical appointments. It was then identified that she needed to go to the eye doctor. We got her to the ophthalmologist. It was determined that she needed cataract surgery. We had one of the CNAs go over two weeks prior and two weeks post this operation and put drops in her eyes twice a day. It was when the nursing assistant was over there that she discovered the house was just unsafe. It was full of trash because this woman could not get out to go to the dump if she can't get to medical appointments. She can't go to the dump. So with her permission, we had volunteers go in and literally clean the house out of the trash so it became a safer environment for her to be in. We continue working with this lady to today. 18 months, we're still going back and forth to medical appointments, dental appointments. The food pantry delivers her food, and it is only because we all work together <clears throat> that we can service the needs of this particular woman. And she is just a single example. There are so many others. So that is what we do to keep our seniors in their home. We'll entertain any questions. Uh, great book, great presentations. Um, and my first question, which you answered at least generally, was the $320,000 operating budget. Um, is that, are there, major, are there major grants that comprise most of that? Or is it a real varied revenue stream that that, um, it's, a, it's a varied revenue stream. We do get grants from both PAC and from Northern Piedmont. Um, okay. But um, I would say that um, we also have some very generous donors um, who have helped us out a great deal. It's not quite 50-50, but it's pretty close. Okay. Um, and then my other question, and I'm glad that we have fire and rescue folks in, in the room, at least in my mind, one area where I feel like we maybe could implement something and maybe there is a role for RAP at home, maybe not. But um, your discussion of the RAP at the door program made me think of this, and that's a great name, by the way. Um, we see in our community, and I know you know this, um, elderly people in particular who often with no other option uh, when they need a little help, whether it's taking medication or maybe falling, we'll call for emergency services, which um, is often the right thing to do, but it is often perhaps not what's needed. And, and to the extent that those types of calls um, are frequent for particular citizens, it's always been my thought that maybe there, and I don't know what the term would be, 
but maybe there would be some system by which we implement uh, someone who had a list and they would just regularly check on those people with the goal of reducing, um, hopefully significantly, uh, those individuals' calls to our dispatch center and then the resulting use of equipment and volunteers and, and paid medical providers. So I just throw that out there because I wonder if there wouldn't be um, some shared interest both between our fire and rescue community and Rapid Home I, um, I to look at yeah. some program like that. I think there would be. And just to let you know, we do get phone calls from the sheriff's office when they've identified somebody that might, that's a senior, that might be in need of our help. And we have gotten a call from fire and rescue too when it's, I'm not, I'm not to say a nuisance call because I don't think any calls no. are nuisance calls, but calls that could probably be solved otherwise, or even if they've identified somebody who might be a fall risk, for us to give them a call and see if they would entertain the thought of us coming and installing one of the guardian alerts. So um, if called upon, we, we certainly try to answer. And I would welcome um, working with fire and rescue because they do see things we don't see. Yeah. And as you know, we do have Harold on our board and he is a great wealth of information yeah. as far as safety in the homes and what needs to happen. Okay, thanks. Just anyway, it's food for thought. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you for the presentation and for the amazing work that Rapid Home does. It, you guys serve an incredible need in this county. And, um, you know, we're just so lucky to have folks like you who are willing to do this work because it's not easy. Well, I tell you what, I feel very lucky to have the board we have and the staff I currently have because we certainly could not do it alone. And the partnerships we've been able to form with the other nonprofits in the area have been have been absolutely incredible and rewarding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we're moving into public comment. Anyone wishing to speak, please be recognized. Give us your name and your district because um, there are people on Zoom that can't see you and that would be great. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Sutton and I live in Piedmont District. Gosh, I am so moved by what I heard here today. This is the most amazing county to live in, to, to grow a family, to build a business, to take, be an elderly person, to have so many caring people. I'm just I'm blown away. And I also have been to a number of meetings and not ever spoken to you all. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. I know your jobs aren't easy. We are kind of a rowdy crowd sometimes, but you are deeply appreciated. And Mr. Curry and his staff as well, he, he and his team do an amazing job keeping our county running smoothly, efficiently, so thank you as well. Um, I'm here today to ask a favor. A few years ago, you all created a matching tourism funds program. And last year, the Farm Tour and Sperry Fest submitted applications and you couldn't approve them because you didn't have a process yet, which everyone understood and I'm hoping that as you work on your budget for next year that you will include the process so we can access these funds because investing in tourism brings in more revenue which will help us not fix our school budget but maybe give a little help and also help with our other activities in the county so I ask you to please consider this as you work on the budget thank, thank you so you. much thanks a lot thank you yes <clears throat> Service announcement. Uh, af after the bees, Anita Ramos, uh, Hampton District. Uh, after the BZA meeting uh, Wednesday night, somebody left this <laughs> out in the street near the end of the evening. So if anyone here who attended that meeting or knows someone that attended that meeting who is missing their beautiful scarf, I have it. Gary knows how to find me. You all know how to find me. Really. But anyway, I hope that it can find a new home. I'm not a butterfly person. I, I just wonder I, if we should give it to Crystal to keep at county administration because maybe that's where somebody would go looking for it. Yeah, I, I let Gary know where I live in case it's... I can't believe that Gary didn't want that beautiful butterfly <laughs> scarf. <laughs> <laughs> I should give it. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Anita. Me. Hi, 
no presence today. Okay. Sheila Gressinger, uh, Hampton District, almost forgot. Don't Sorry. Forget. Um, I sort of want to touch on the growth of our villages because uh, after that last um, big, huge meeting that uh, was very interesting and I do agree with the decision because it seemed to me to be on a technicality for a specific housing area. But a lot of people were talking about, oh my gosh, Rappahannock is gonna become Loudoun County and there were just, there are just so many people who are just horrified and they keep bringing up Loudoun County and I wanna say, cool it, here's the deal. Loudoun County left the barn door open decades ago, decades. If you look at Dulles, Dulles is in Loudoun County. I can remember working for a newspaper based in DC and I couldn't believe having to go clear out to Dulles because there was nothing there. If you look at Sterling, Virginia, that's Loudoun County. That's been building up for decades. When I was still built, uh, selling houses in Leesburg, Lansdowne came up, huge housing thing. And, it, and the interesting thing is we also had to keep track of, of traffic and everything. And I had had tons of people coming by my specific site because they would get lost. I was not in a drive-by situation. And it was, everyone was getting funneled off into Lansdowne and there were so many buildings, office uh, builders there that Nobody came to my place, nobody got lost. So that specific thing is not going to occur around here. Here's, uh, I cannot draw and I'm not a techie, but I do have this thing that showed a map to you guys a long time ago. We have major highways. We have 29 to 11 that comes down from uh, DC into Charlottesville. We have I-66 that comes over. We have I-81. We do have 211 that comes through our county, but it doesn't do anything for us as far as helping us. Years ago, we used to have hundreds of leaf peepers uh, in the fall. We used to have, I can remember I came 42 years ago. There were tons of apple stands. When I-66 I came, it vanished like poof, and there was nothing there. Now we are lucky to be able to be having um, entrepreneurs, small businesses that are building up and, and they are, are bringing back the industry that, that program, uh, buy local, buy fresh, I think has helped us tremendously with all of our little um, agricultural things. Um, let me see, I don't wanna get lost. The, oh, the comp plan mentions changing demographics, okay. And it did specifically say how we had an aging population and we had to prepare for that. Here's the deal. Eventually that comp plan is, needs to be addressed and redone because instead of an aging population, I am seeing younger families coming in. Uh, our FA, FA, FAA, Future Farmers of America is growing. Our 4-H is growing. There are more kids who are actually coming here. Our little church is seeing more children. So I think those demographics are changing. And I think the comp plan saying that growth in and around the villages is something we need to pay very close attention to. Phil Irwin used to come in and talk about paying attention to what the state legislature was doing. They are talking about affordable housing and how are they going to see Rappahannock, what are we doing to provide affordable housing? Our comp plan says um, specifically uh, housing for the various income brackets. So how are we addressing that? Uh, Chuck Ackrey is doing that with the, his little Rush River Commons. But as far as other places in and around our villages, we need to be able to be encouraging people to build houses, to build houses. And there are also houses that need to be fixed up. People can do that. I mean, my mom used to say, don't expect to leave off, to start where we left off. Kids can start with an apartment. They can start with house sharing. There are all different ways that we can be attracting kids to be living here. And I'm hoping that I'm, I'm starting to see that kind of
community uh, taking place. Um, the other, okay, that's the end of that. Um, I, I want to continue to recognize the work our fire and rescue uh, squad is doing in Flint Hill. I think against all odds, they are per, they're being persistent in, in pursuing uh, putting an organization together well. They're having a, a swing dance or a spring dance kind of thing, which is a way that I think um, Mr. Was Furbush, who was running against Debbie, had talked about what are we doing with our fire and rescue to, to be doing things? And so I think, I think that organization is starting to come together and re reestablish a, a community spirit that we used to have a long time ago. There used to be carnivals and things, and as people died off, the support there sort of left. Um, the last thing I will comment on, um, communication. Uh, I want to commend the Board of Supervisors for having their uh, meeting on February 10th. It was an effort to uh, bring together a group of people and discuss various ways um, that they could learn about each other and also figure out ways to work together to accomplish a lot of the things that are in the pipeline that, that we need to address. The courthouse is one of them. I'm not going to beat that one, but that needs to be addressed as well. So I think there was a very unfortunate happenstance where a particular listserv sort of went off the rails on this. And the problem with that is there, it, it is appropriate to try to address correct information uh, and, and get those get those avenues open in, in a good way. And um, I think a couple people that I know of have been trying to uh, present correct information uh, rather than uh, this dispute of disinformation and all that kind of stuff, which I think is a detriment to everyone. Name calling and that kind of stuff is not very grown up. And uh, as I said before to a particular one, He's a very smart man, and he can certainly improve his vocabulary on RAPNET. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Not seeing any more hands in the courtroom. We do have some folks on Zoom. Anyone wishing to speak during public comment, please raise your Zoom hand and be recognized. Not seeing any hands on Zoom, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Thank you. All right. Consent agenda. I'll make a motion to adopt the consent agenda. I'll second uh, Van's motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, David. All right. <clears throat> Appointments to Rappahannock any County Recreational Facilities Authority. Let's uh, highlight the fact that I have not received any applications. You still have one vacancy, and so please beat the streets. I'm working on it. Okay. I'll keep going. Yep. All right. Uh, old business. County construction and renovation projects. Uh, yes, uh, there's an update provided for you in the packet, and I'll just run through, and then uh, there is an action step here uh, that I'm looking for guidance from the board. Uh, regarding the historic building envelope restoration, uh, the exterior building scanning was completed over two days during, uh, because of some snow. Um, the second set of those uh, plans, or uh, 2D plans from the outside of the building, uh, were I received today, uh, so that architect is is starting to work on the plans for the envelope, and uh, he and I will be working with our maintenance staff on um, Wednesday morning uh, to uh, look at um, some of the damaged sections of the old church to make sure that there can be uh, specific repairs identified 
for that uh, structural, those structural members of that, that building. Uh, so that project is progressing. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and then we'll come back to number two. Uh, Commonwealth Attorney Office uh, roof replacement, that project is complete. Uh, it was put to bid and the low bid was 14360 so it was bid out, bids received, and the work is done. So that's always good to, good to know. Uh, the EMS Sheriff Garage processing building that's included in the capital budget for this year. Uh, local architect Rick Lassard is working on that design. It is in the town, so it does require an architectural review board review. Um, we expect to submit an application to the ARB this week, uh, and that ARB meeting is on March 18th. Pretty nondescript. It's a, uh, essentially a three-bay garage that has uh, white clapboard siding and a standing seam roof. I expect that the ARB will be happy. We've talked with the uh, neighbor to the rear um, just to... Um, brief them on the, the plan design and they, they seem happy and actually and borrowed the not quite white color of their home as the color of this structure. Um, so I will send that uh, ARB package out to the board um, when it's pulled together later this week. Uh, so that is uh, finally progressing. Uh, regarding the courthouse building expansion project, um, as the board's aware, the RFP 24001 was sent out, uh, published um, a few different ways. Uh, we did receive proposals, and I've told others that there um, is an adequate but not overwhelming number of uh, proposals that we have received. Um, and uh, so that's good. I think we have a, a very good uh, pathway towards identifying successful uh, architectural slash engineering team to guide the board through uh, the process to identify a selected concept, well, finalize space program, identify a uh, selected concept, and then drive that concept through the various design stages on through to bidding and construction. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot to do. And the most important thing is finding an A team that, is, um, that fits our community, that understands um, the intricacies of Rappahannock County, the town of Washington, and has demonstrated through their past work that they can design projects that suit the area where they're working. So they know what to do to design a big city courthouse maybe, and they also know what to do to design a very small town courthouse. And if they have shown that they can do both of those in the past, they can probably figure ours out. Um, so when, when the board authorized me to release the RFP to seek the proposals that are now in hand, um, I told there was we got bogged down a little bit in conversation about how were we going to select the um, the, the uh, offer who best meets our needs and I said well at least let's get the RFP out and we'll cross the bridge of how we're going to select them later well today is later uh, on figuring out that process uh, I am recommending uh, as shown here in the board packet that uh, the county administrator form a committee consisting of several individuals to include the board chair, a second board member, myself, the county attorney, slash commonwealth attorney, uh, one or both clerks, depending on their interest, and then uh, two citizens. Uh, that committee would then review the printed proposals, arrive at a ranking uh, based on the requirements set forth in the RFP, um, shortlist the defined list of firms, and invite them to on-site presentations and then um, make a recommendation of the, ultimately the ranking of firms to the board. The way uh, professional services are selected in Virginia, it's called competitive negotiation. You, you don't bid, it's not a low bid. Uh, the theory is you, you don't want the person who can design the bridge the cheapest, you want the person who can design the bridge that works. Um, and so you identify the firm that can design a courthouse that meets our needs and fits our needs and then once you rank those offers, then you be, uh, and you set that ranking, um, one, two, three, et cetera, you negotiate with the top ranked offer and you determine financially whether you can come to terms with that offer. And if you can, great. You bind a contract and you move on your way. If you can't, you cast them aside and you go on to number two and one is never to be discussed again. Um, that's the way you do it in Virginia for professional services. Uh, so the most important thing then is how do you come at that 
uh, come to the ranking. Uh, and so my recommendation is here on the page, as I just uh, reiterated, I'm looking for concurrence for the board or a recommendation of an alternative. I did include an uh, on-board docs, and I passed out uh, for you at your spots a document that identifies um, pertinent portions of the RFP relative to the selection process, as well as the Code of Virginia that identifies, um, as envisioned, this would not be a public body subject to FOIA relative to noticing the meeting three days in advance. However, based on the RFP and based on FOIA, if it was to be a public body formed by this board, uh, then um, we've committed to the offers that we won't be releasing the information about the proposals until an award is made. And the Code of Virginia allows you to do perform all these deliberations in closed meeting. Um, so that's the path, the, the, the options forward, and you have my recommendation. Thank you, Gary. Um, I will make a motion then to um, uh, authorize the county administrator to, and I'm going to put my own words in here, to using the Virginia Supreme Court guidelines to form an advisory panel committee to uh, help with this process on items one through four. Is that detailed enough? Uh, yeah. I'll second your motion. I think that's, it seems to be the one, one action item that would come out of at least today's discussion, the closure of the REP process. So that makes sense to me. So the, the way it's phrased on the agenda, it would make it sound like you've already put together a county administrator formed, or is that administrator hyphen formed committee? Uh, uh, that's what it meant. I, okay. I apologize for the poor word. Okay. Well, I don't know that there is a better way to communicate it. I just had to make sure the yeah. way that I I have read not. It was I, what I have intended. I have discussed with a few citizens if they'd be interested. Um, and that's as far as I've, I've gotten it. And I've talked to the Commonwealth's attorney. I have not yet talked to um, uh, any either of the clerks, quite frankly. I assume that the clerks will be jumping at the opportunity. <laughs> well, I think it's great that we would do it this way, but my recollection is from when the building committee was disbanded was that the criticism there was that that committee wasn't open enough and there weren't minutes and um, there wasn't a clear way to see what they had done. And this is a committee that will be at a, a committee of the county, county administrator and definitely not have to keep minutes, nor will it be subject to FOIA. So it will even be further closed uh, to the public than the building committee. So I just don't understand how folks are reconciling that paradox, um, that it will be more closed than ever, um, but that was your criticism of the building committee. What are you saying, me? Well, you in particular, but no, I, I, I didn't hear anyone disagreeing with you. That was not a criticism, it was a point. Um, but anyway, I'll just say for this, <laughs> this was on, in that October meeting, my suggestion was to use the Virginia Supreme Court guidance to come up with an advisory panel. So if you go to page four through 12, it shows you how to do this. And in an RFP process, there's just protocol that people want to follow. Uh, I'm not a professional, I'm not an engineer or architect. But if you read the guidance, it says, hey, form an advisory panel like this and move forward. That was my suggestion in October. I, I genuinely was not trying to criticize anybody over minutes. There was a point about something else. But I hear you. I just wanted to add, though, about the motion that I made. Um, I don't necessarily want to limit it to uh, two constitutional officers or two citizens. So can I just change it to a minimum? If, if more constitutional officers uh, want to be um, in involved. I'll accept your friendly amendment on the second. And I'm assuming that the citizen uh, judges would have been included in the citizen part, correct? They're not. Uh, well, they're not one of the others, yeah, but so they are included that, within the Supreme so Court guidelines. I mean, yeah. and it's it's not clear to me whether um, their schedules would allow involvement in all steps, but maybe some steps. I just want to make sure that we do have all those parties involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? 
I just hope that everyone realizes that this is the second time that we've all embarked on this journey together. And we did choose to include these people on our first iteration of doing it as a committee of the board. However, it was done in a different style, not as formal a style, but these people were consulted. And um, if you all want to formalize it and that makes you feel better, and this is uh, how you're committing to do it now, um, I just hope that we arrive at a fruitful place at the end of this uh, road, this time. And I, I, sh I do want to share that um, while it wouldn't be a public body that would require advance notice of a meeting and entering closed meeting, uh, the records are public and they would be uh, releasable. However, um, there would be a restriction available during the vetting process. Right. And once an award is made, then the file's open. Uh, and that's what we told everybody in RFP. Uh, and it would be open to everybody, including whatever notes are taken during the process. All right. I'm going to move for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll get on it. New commercial activity and related matters, Mr. Whitson. Uh, sure, I'll just, uh, I'm largely going to echo what the mayor of the town of Washington, I think, uh, said recently. Um, Rush River Commons, um, the, the food pantry building, many of you have probably seen it driving by, is framed in. The small office building adjacent to it is, uh, is beginning to be framed in. And it's my understanding then that the the housing component of that project, all of which is within the town and not part of the previously agreed upon boundary line adjustment. It's all in the town. Um, it's all been reviewed by the Architectural Review Board, so it's now just in ongoing construction phase. Um, I did receive uh, a complaint about um, truck traffic um, blocking access to the post office, but that has been resolved, and I, again, want to thank um, the property owner, Mr. Ockery, and Mr. Burke, who has been operating as, as, as his site oversight manager for really being sensitive to any adverse effects on neighbors or traffic during this process. I think the construction scene is going to calm down now to some extent. Um, and then separately, I, I mentioned last time that um, regarding the parking situation related to increased staffing at the end of Little Washington, still an ongoing concern. Um, I do have a request in the VDOT to uh, mark more clearly some no parking areas so that traffic can flow better through the town. Um, so that's underway. Um, but it's, I think for the most part, the project, while significant in the town of Washington at Rush River Commons, um, it's been going uh, more or less smoothly vis-a-vis -vis traffic and trouble for neighbors. So again, grateful to the property owner for being sensitive to that. I know you were working on another fire hydrant somewhere. To yeah, and I'm the the town really wants to uh, take the lead on that process. So there's a there's a uh, there's a hydrant removed on Piedmont. Um, it's on the main water line, but outside of the town. And so that, I, in fact, was in touch with the mayor recently about that. And we'd also like to use the opportunity, if we are able, to identify other potential sites for hydrants that might make sense. And I thought perhaps I could talk to Mr. Stevens um, to coordinate that effort. Um, but I think to the extent that we have a town with a water system without overdoing it, um, it, it makes good sense. And I should mention that I have a constituent on Grandview who recently received notice um, from his homeowner, homeowner insurance provider that they were, and this might not be an exact, exactly correct summary of what he received. Um, this is the second time I've had a constituent raise this with me. Their homeowner's insurance provider basically said because of distance to a hydrant, which out here, obviously, that's not doesn't seem like a reasonable measure of, um, of, of your access to um, fire mitigation measures. But nevertheless, he, I think, received a rate increase. And so the question is, 
what can we do from a county government perspective to communicate uh, with uh, insurance providers and also what might we be able to do in terms of hydrant expansion, but recognizing that you can't really do that without a water system. So, so, so the insurance world uh, works off of ISO ratings and there are urban and rural ratings and it has a lot to do with the availability of water. Having a pond on or near your property can help. And so uh, there are a lot of different things that can affect that. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Stevens could identify all of those variables and see if there are any that a local government could affect. Uh, and then regarding Rush River, I did want to say that uh, Mr. Burke reached out to the county, myself and Mr. Cornell, to talk about phasing and how they are wanting to safely phase in the new buildings up front as they come online. And uh, I think we're having good conversations about that so the food pantry can open uh, in a safe way before the residential is done and maybe before the front office is done as long as there's proper separation and uh, proper life safety in place. I know we enjoyed dry weather for a long time when that project started. Have there been <clears throat> issues with runoff or ponding? I have not. There's one particular neighbor across the highway who um, uh, knows how to get in touch with Mr. Burke. Uh, and I'm sure if that's happened, I'm sure they have. Yeah, and, and I've been over to that property, and there definitely was some runoff that was ending up in their pond, and and the Ocri team made a commitment to them at the outset that whatever whatever happened to their pond during the process, despite all their best efforts, would be addressed. Yeah, all the water from this site goes into that pond. Yeah, right. Just the way it routes, and so. Yeah, I remember that conversation from yeah. what it was planned. Do insurance companies take the ponds that we've... Um, oh, yeah. Hmm. Ponds are included. Um, well, you, I think it's more of a case-by-case, -case, but... Right. Uh, yeah. Grandview might be a tough one. It, it's on kind of on a ridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it Good is a grand that. view. Yep. Um, yeah. All right. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. For Virginia the question. DEQ Climate Response Network well approved. Uh, yes, uh, board members will remember this has been a long standing item. It's been uh, held up in um, the DEQ's property side and working with the Attorney General's office to get eas an easement and plat prepared. Um, I was alerted well, a couple weeks ago now that uh, the process was done. We received a draft. Um, and then we received a, a final version after I made some comments. Um, those documents are attached. Um, my original thought was that the board would have to hold a public hearing to grant uh, interest in this real property because that's normally what you have to do. Uh, but that code section, and I uh, went checked with Mr. Goff, doesn't apply to state. So if you convey it to the state, then you don't have to do the public hearing process or another locality. Um, so you don't need to do this. This in, would encumber a small area of the back corner of the four acres that's in the town setback uh, for the easement and then inside the setback for the actual well, which is really just a 10 by 10 easement. It was selected to be as out of the way as possible. And uh, it's tough to get your, um, your positioning here, but... Uh, Mount Salem and uh, Porter Street are up here. This little property that says Rappahannock County is the white building where our paramedics are housed. Sheriff's office would be over here. So this is the gravel road that heads back behind and to where the radio tower and building are located in this area. Uh, the proposed uh, storage building and processing building is in this area just this side of the radio tower building. So this is all the way in the back. Avon Hall is, is yeah. on the back line, uh, and there's a 25-foot setback here. So this temporary easement is in that setback if they ever have to maintain the well. And then the well itself is just inside the setback, off really in the corner where it's out of the way. Uh, and the idea is this well would be in place for uh, the next 100-plus years and would be uh, a way for... Uh, the climatologist to review groundwater over long periods of time. Hmm. Um, so uh, this site was viewed as 
better than the school site for various reasons. So if the board w wanted to move this forward, uh, you would authorize the chair to sign the easement uh, that is attached and made part of this agenda item. And we started talking about this, what, two or three two years, years ago? ago? It was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then I'll move to authorize the chair to sign the provided deed of easement authorizing the Virginia DEQ to access county property to advance and monitor our climate response well. It was very well stated. I'll Thank second you. that motion. All right. We have a motion a second. Any further discussion? I just want to say that, um, you know, we don't talk a lot about resource management as a board. Um, we probably should talk about it more, but our plates are already full with a lot of other things, whether we anticipate them or not. Um, but in terms of long-term planning, uh, this is probably something that we should spend more time on. And I'm glad we're doing this so we can start to get numbers and a foundation for future planning. And what wasn't said is uh, this is a state project. State will advance the well, monitor the well. It'll be connected to cellular and all that stuff. Great. Thanks, we don't Gary. have to pay for it other than our time through now. Thank you. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 No opposed. Okay. General Assembly. Goodness. Uh, this, this probably should have been an old business. I just I apologize. I dropped it probably in the wrong spot, but because uh, it was new business last month. Uh, it's just a rundown of some of the bills that you've been following and um, updated this on March 1st. So there might have been a little bit of activity yesterday. I'm not sure. Uh, House Bill 8. 818 uh, is seeking to define meetings and public business relative to gatherings. This comes out of a court case. Um, mm -hmm. it, this appears that it is going to move on through. Is that Prince William County? Yes. Okay. Um, it's still not crystal clear, but it's clearer. Uh, there's always going to be some subjectivity. Uh, one of the important things that did come out of this is it makes it clear that if members of this body go to a, a meeting of another body, it's not a board meeting. <laughs> well, I yeah. mean, and we need, we need legislation to explain that, yeah. apparently. Um, unpaved road maintenance flexibility, we talked a little bit about that. There's uh, companion bills. This also appears to be uh, flying through without any issue. Uh, the secondary road program that we'll be entering here shortly with uh, briefing in April and a public hearing in May uh, is the process through which the board allocates funding to generally hard surface or gravel roads. Um, what this does is it expands the, uh, your ability to not only hard surface those gravel roads, but perhaps keep some roads gravel and just improve them from a drainage or grading perspective. Uh, this was led by Loudoun County, who has a ton of gravel roads in their western front. Uh, so I think this, this is probably something that the board could use at some point in time, particularly uh, when we get to a point where there aren't any more gravel roads that people want hard serviced. Uh, SB 544, uh, Chair Donahay and I were talking about this just before the meeting. This is the one land use bill that got through. Most of the others were, were killed. Um, but uh, it started out as uh, disallowing a special exception for short-term rentals in an accessory dwelling unit. Then in committee, it got morphed into disallowing short-term rentals, rentals in a primary residence and totally eliminated the ADU part. <laughs> and finally, a crossover, they fixed the name to take ADU out of the name of the bill. This has made it all the way through, and it's made so far through the crossover process. What it says is that new ordinance cannot be adopted that requires special exception. So if you already have one, then you made it before the wire. There's some confusion, however, what that means relative to when a board amends an ordinance that pre-existed. When does it, be, does it ever become new? Um, any way you look at it, it's the state trying to tell you that you cannot require a special exception. At the committee hearing, uh, the patron basically said, well, this doesn't mean you can't uh, just say you can't have them at all. Just as you can't have a special exception. Specific to the primary resident? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you could just preclude them. Um, when asked what primary residence meant, the patron also said, well, the localities will have to figure that out. Because really, there's no definition. 
That sounds about right. Yeah. So, um, so that's one we're looking at. Uh, HB 1461, another short-term uh, rental property bill that I wasn't on my radar and just came up in uh, last Friday when I was in a regional meeting. And it's related to the locality's ability to prohibit a lessee of, of a sub lessee operator. So, so it's, it's trying to get at apartment buildings and the tenant being able to rent the space out for a short term rental. I don't know how much it will affect us, but um, there were some terms added here recently recommended by Ms. Graham to some of the short-term rentals to try to make sure this didn't happen uh, when people are trying to get around our rules and not pay taxes. Uh, uh, the HB 800 and SB 713, which was the poll attachment um, bills, those have been heavily substituted and it seems like everybody's either equally happy or dissatisfied with the bill and they're moving through and they will get approved. Um, there are companion <coughs> funding uh, measures in both the House and Senate bills for about $30 million, million for FY22 VADI projects, of which ours is one, uh, intended to fund the commitments made and process of those other two bills. Um, you can see there's a, list, a long list of failed bills uh, that we're very happy. Some are continued to 2025. In some cases, that kills them. In other cases, we just need to pay attention next year. Uh, all the solar ones eventually died. But there, that is an area where there, there's going to be continued pressure with the state having statewide goals to provide power for our urban areas at the expense of rural areas. When I was reading about all of this LCI issues throughout the Commonwealth, I mean, the one county that put in a bunch of solar panels yeah. to help, their LCI just went up big time because they're making money off their solar panels. Your assessed, your assessed <laughs> value goes up. It's just yeah. insane. But anyway. Yeah. All right. Frustrating. Yes. I'd worry about that, but I think ours is maxed out already. Ours is maxed. So they can't <laughs> so make our LCI any higher they, this year. Unless they go over 800, well, we, I mean, we can only hey, hope for the don't give best. them something to think about. <laughs> All right, Community Action Agencies Program. Uh, Mr. Carney. Uh, Mr. Carney asked uh, uh, if I could put something on the agenda. I provided some very preliminary or high level information. Um, uh, some of you may have heard of some projects that Skyline Cap has been doing in Madison. Um, and Skyline Cap used to provide a Healthy Families program here under contract, but our Community Action Agency, who administers a community action program, is People Inc. Uh, and each cap is uh, assigned to a particular area. And so ours is People Inc. Um, your representative on People, People Inc. is Gail Crooks. She reached out to me ahead of this meeting and said, Hey, I see this on the agenda. Anything going on? And I told her this is just the very general, this is what caps are and provide some information as food for thought that the board might want to better understand and receive a presentation or um, list of programs that uh, the agencies provide at a later time. Um, and is anything else that you wanted to cover or? No, uh, Mr. Atkins on the Planning Commission had circulated this email and he had mm. uh, talking about the wonderful things that had gotten gotten done between Skyline Cap and Madison County. And um, I, I thought, I read the article and I thought that, um, you know, it was really, really interesting what they were doing down there. So I thought it was, since I've been on the board, I have not had a presentation from these folks. And so I thought it was, um, you know, worthwhile to kind of circle back around. I know that they have come and spoken before. I just, I hadn't been on the board and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we were covering bases and keeping abreast of our partners and what they do. Yeah, the housing program in Madison uh, is levered by a state grant that's funneled through the Rep Hannock Rapid and Regional Commission that's funding some housing in Madison, Culpeper, and Fauquier. Um, I don't think there's any in Orange, none here. Um, I know in the, uh, more than six years ago, there was some thoughts about people like doing a housing program here and that 
uh, didn't matriculate for various reasons, and I doubt that they would stick their neck out to do it again unless the board signaled that that was something you were interested in. Wasn't well, Skyline Cap um, at the helm of the Head Start program? They were as well. That's right. That would, I, and it looked like from the press that was circulated that perhaps the leadership has changed in that organization. That's uh, possible. I know um, Mr. Yowell is their finance person who also happens to be a board member in Madison, so he's been my point of contact. Um, I, I don't know how or why Skyline Cap was running the finances for our Head Start program. Um, it's before my time, too. Yeah. We got, we got uh, but here they were. time, Gary. Yeah, they were. And, uh, but we're just not eligible anymore from a demographics perspective for that. Um, but I think, I'm sure People Inc. would love to come in and uh, give you a general presentation if we invited them. I think that would be a good idea. Um, I work with People Inc. in another role I serve, and we have several, there are several crossover um, agencies, and sometimes when you're, you're working with these different agencies, what one can do and the services they provide. Um, <clears throat> it's confusing. So I think that would be an excellent idea to have them come and do a presentation. All right. What, one thing I wanted to raise is since Van um, added this as an agenda item, and I talked to Ms. Comer about it recently since she's she knows Fauquier County better than anyone I know. Um, there was a really interesting article, um, and it was an article about something I've been observing for the last year or so. And many of you will remember a restaurant on Route 17 outside of Warrington called Ben and Mary's Steakhouse. Mm -hmm. And um, we went there once, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but um, it is now, uh, through the work, and I just looked up the, some of the reporting on it, um, it really moved quickly, but the Foothills Housing Corporation, this is the photo caption, transformed the former Ben and Mary Steakhouse on US 17 into four new apartments while preserving the building's recognizable exterior. And I, I know, and to Ms. Gressinger's point, my thought whenever anyone raises the question of affordable housing in Rapan County, my question is, gosh, why don't we find a way to work with what we have as opposed to building new stuff? Because this is Rapan County, and I think we're pretty much wired against a lot of new stuff. Um, so I wonder if, as part of a discussion with regional organizations that look at the question of housing, if this organization, Foothills Housing Corporation, might be worth chatting to. That corporation might have been stood up particularly for that project, which is another one of the projects that was funded through the state funding that's administered through the Regional Commission. Um, and we just had an update on that okay. at our last meeting. But we can definitely get the right people yeah. in the room. I mean, I, I, I was driving down Tiger Valley on Saturday, and I saw a number of abandoned properties and now I understand that deeds and ownership and all that might might preclude someone from purchasing those or make it too difficult to bother with but nevertheless when you go around the county there are many dwellings and we've seen the stats as part of the census that are not occupied not inhabitable and the question is how do how do we do a better job in sort of making life easy for people who want to acquire those properties and turn them into housing without building new stuff. So just a thought. Uh, Ms. Ms. Crooks did um, reach out via chat saying, we do have an MOU with Skyline Cat for Healthy Families. It's a non-dollar non MOU. Mm. I wonder too, as part of this uh, conversation and also, uh, to refresh the Planning Commission, uh, the RRC work that was done a few years ago on affordable housing. There was a housing study completed, yeah. um, and uh, the, the comp plan was done 
months before that study was done. Right. And so it basically references that the study was ongoing and that information would have to be right. added in later. So we, yeah. you, uh, Patrick Monty has never come and given a presentation on that. He could. I would recommend we wait till after the budget. But I would recommend we wait until after the budget, too. But what I wanted to say, and that was my recollection, too, Gary, was that it may be helpful in framing these conversations if you would circulate those materials because some of the players have changed. Yeah to both bodies and that way we can read that study and have that in our mind as we take this topic forward. Yes, that's all on mm -hmm. the Regional Commission's website and I'll send a link. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. yep. I, help. Think, I think that is a great idea though to have them come give us a presentation after the budget. Okay. If you guys are amenable. Patrick's a good guy. It's always nice yep. to see him. And just keep the conversation rolling. I know that Mr. Adkins is a huge, he's a champion of it, so I think it's a good thing to keep, keep an eye on. Yep. All right, um, going ahead to move into the First Amendment protections, Mr. Carney, I think. Oh, so I, I asked uh, Mr. Curry to put this on the agenda apropos our, um, the retreat that we did, and uh, the facilitators had mentioned um, having, you know, our county attorney come up with some protocols um, so that during public comment, generally, <clears throat> the public is protected and we are protected, everybody is, um, so that we can make sure that our, our meetings are, just don't overstep. Um, and we don't have anything currently in place. So I know that we have a lot going on. I just wanted to put this on there so, because I thought it was a really mm -hmm. big takeaway for me from that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I know that we've talked about uh, public comment apropos Zoom. And we had a big discussion about that. And this all rolls into the same thing. So I just wanted to keep it on everybody's radar and make sure and see, I don't know, take a temperature, but I, I'd be fine to address this sort of after uh, the budget, but it's something that we would need Mr. Goff to look at and kind of come up with, hey, here's, here, here are the guidelines, here are the, here are the parameters. I wonder if we could see what other counties are doing and just copy and paste if it makes sense for Rappahannock County or and, edit. Yeah, you'd certainly want uh, legal counsel to review it because not all other counties perhaps have review things with their legal counsel, uh, particularly those who seek to cut off public comment, which is right. generally not allowed. No. And I think that was the, if I remember correctly, during that discussion, during our retreat, it was something that had happened in Albemarle County. That's right. And like people were kind of going crazy and it got pretty ugly. And the question is, what do you do in that situation, if anything? And I also just want to make sure that as a public body, we don't get confused with our own power right. and silence the community. Right, right. That, that's my biggest concern. I mean, I think that we'll all be fine in a meeting. I just want to make sure that people have their voice. Ultimately, if somebody stands up and says a number of objectionable things, um, the chair should be well informed by legal mm -hmm. of what um, what they can't do, right. <laughs> which is so, which is exactly. cut them off, exactly. uh, short of the five minutes, three minutes, or whatever exactly. guidelines that she exactly. set. And so having that, you know, having a script for her to refer to was probably yeah. valuable in that case. That's the point. So is this something we could kind of slow track <laughs> <laughs> till after the budget, or how do you? How are you feeling, Mr. Goff? Um, I think it, it's it's. Actually, a lot simpler than it sounds because pretty much you can't viewpoint, you know, uh, discriminate. So if somebody stands up and starts saying "Hi, Hitler," all that you just gotta let them go on. Now you can just impose very strict time limits, but you gotta apply it equally. And that's where I think sometimes the board might might like what somebody's hearing, let them go on for six minutes. You don't like what the other guy's saying, you cut them off at three. So. Um, it, it, but I, the Albemarle uh, County Attorney came up with a pretty good brief about it. Oh, okay. And I think I shared it with Gary or uh, something. I mean, if I share so much with him, he doesn't know what day it is. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get it done, say, August meeting, have it like, ironed out complete. Oh, by then, for I, sure. Hopefully before <laughs> then, yeah. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> Gary's like, Let's let's not leave the impression that it will take us till August <laughs> to do something. Well, I like simple. setting low expectations. But that's, that's, a, that's a new bar. I did. I'm, I'm glad you intervened. Yes. And, and 
said, yeah, we can do it. But it sounds like there's something to work off of somewhere. There's a brief. Um, well, there's, there are plenty of yeah. examples of what not to do. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Chronicled across YouTube. Okay. <laughs> All right. Board committee reports. Recreational Facilities Authority. You had a meeting, I believe. Well, they did have a meeting, and I attended. And, and uh, Mr. make Carney's sure you've place. got your mic where it's um, good. Yep. Yeah, I attended in uh, Mr. Carney's place, and they were still working on fodder stack. Um, April twentieth. Yes. Twenty. Yeah. Twenty. Twenty. Okay. The only reason I know it's my birthday, so I Happy kind of yeah. Thanks. Birthday. Yeah. Free entry. Yeah. 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 I would encourage everybody to participate in that one way or another, having done that race myself, having someone at the top of each of those three hills cheering you on is key. <laughs> but, um, and they were working on, on park improvements. It seemed to be going very well. It's my first meeting, so um, yeah, great, great. people. Mm -hmm. uh, Public Safety Committee, we have not met uh, the clearing kind of took over that. Yeah, date. we'll get that uh, set up here sometime soon. Planning Commission. Oh, would you all plan, when you all have the Public Safety Committee, would you please let me know those dates? Because I know there were some things that were brought up at the pedestrian and safety meeting mm. that are really Public Safety mm. Committee um, matters more than got another citizen group matters. Um, Planning Commission met. Uh, we worked on the two uh, ordinance changes that you'll see this evening. We did not have any applications to work through. It was just that. Uh, Fire Levy Board. I was out of town, so I was not there, but Mr. Curry was. I was there. Um, the, the group uh, was fully represented except for Mr. Carney uh, worked through um, the bills from each of the seven companies and the budget requests for the association. The association hasn't had a request over the last couple of years because they were working off a balance. Uh, that um, holiday from the association budget request is over, and they've requested, I believe, $102,000. Uh, uh, Bonnie and I have asked for some details on their past year expenditures just so we can fully understand that, that they're annual recurring or there's um, 102 is really needed and I'm sure it is if they ask for it and the fire levy board uh, endorsed it um, regarding all the other companies I believe the total was in the eight hundred and thirty forty thousand dollar range so add to that the 102 add to that um, the funding for Chester Gap which um, Warren County has stated they will include in their budget again this coming year and add to that the Sperryville pilot and I believe funding is going to be tight in the fire levy um, fund and so Bonnie's not with us today so she can keep cranking away <laughs> at the budget. I, I know that there's been a couple of emails about the the legal bills at the fire levy fund. Yes. And I just um, I certainly don't want volunteer companies to get stuck with legal bills, but it certainly seems to me like they should be addressed with VFIS if they're VFIS eligible. Yes. And not cycled into the, the, the you know, bill pay slash budget ask for the following year, mm -hmm. because I, I don't want us to kind of see elongated shadows when in fact it should be a smaller amount yeah. that's part of the request the different companies handle reimbursables differently and that's something maybe would be good for the fire levy board to handle in in a recommended guidelines to the board some of them um, in at the period of expenditure list the expenditure and submit the report um, and then on, a, on their next period of expenditure every six months uh, list the negative and then so it's kind of flows in flows out and everything averages out over time uh, others just never show it at all because um, they're, offsetting. they're offsetting and they don't even show it um, and so maybe standardization there would be good uh, because this informs the budget um, you That's know the point. 
um, you know, Bonnie and I are trying to look at the full, kind of the multi-year spend of some of these companies to make sure that we don't have weird anomalies happening in the budget that we recommend. Um, Flint Hill, for example, for the first six months had like 20 some odd thousand dollars of expenses because there was no EMS expenses at all. Right. And then all of a sudden they're spooling up EMS expenses again. Right. And so it's, it's very um, uneven right now. So we're trying to smooth things out. And any assumptions that we make, we'll make sure we make it clear to the board if it's different than just the plain fire levy board numbers. Yeah, that's my only concern, and I I got the impression there was a split vote on that, right? Three of the members. Uh, there was uh, four, four, three abstentions. Well, it's come up, and I think now the key is to clarify what what our, our insurance policy does and does not cover. Correct. And then if it's clear that th those kinds of legal proceedings are covered, then maybe to your point. You don't have a situation where potentially a quarterly spend then results in an accumulation of maybe um, expenses that would inform a budget incorrectly. Correct. Which I think is the key point. That is. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I understand that BFIS is looking at reimbursement, which is wonderful news for everyone. Right. Um, and so I, I will say um, when Dr. Hill came to us and said, we really should have coverage for these sorts of things. Um, Bonnie, Bonnie and, and I said, yeah, that we should. And so we went to VFIS and we said, you know, what would it take to get coverage for these sorts of things? And so they looked into it and said, well, you already have coverage for injunctive relief. Um, and we just didn't realize it. Uh, now, whether that covers all, everything, including a non-monetary FOIA, we're not entirely sure. Uh, so uh, that we're sorting through that and, you know, Claims will be made, and they've already been noticed, but they'll be made, and we'll see what happens. Sounds good. <clears throat> Moving into treasurer's reports, cash graphs looking good. Yeah, everything uh, looks good. And uh, as we keep talking, um, big time capital projects, um, the Board of Supervisors at some point in time, led by Ms. Jewell, no doubt, will be asked to look at some policies on how you want to uh, manage your cash and uh, designate um, some of your um, fund balance uh, as being restricted or designated for a yeah. capital project. And um, the my message I keep telling you is if you look at this kind of low point, that tells you how much and the curves kind of follow each other, right? So uh, you, you, can make, you can pay your bills as long as that low point's above zero. Uh, we would never want it to be zero because we want a buffer. In the past, it was below zero, and we yep. borrowed money, uh, which is a bad plan uh, because you could have an issue where there is a natural disaster and a low point, and yep. so you're going to make payroll. You somehow have to front natural disaster costs, and you don't get reimbursed till later. So the good news is, is your low point is you know seven eight million dollars. It takes some off for uh, a buffer. You take some off for what is already restricted for other projects. Yep. And then you begin to understand what your truly undesignated fund balance is uh, as informed by cash. And then that can go towards uh, upfront design costs and paying down some of the capital needs that you have, uh, one-time needs, uh, before you and help you understand just how much debt you need to go out and get. And in Ms. Jewell's uh, preliminary presentation, she showed where you were um, several years ago when you had three bonds and $8 million borrowed and what sort of debt service that required. So you kind of start to put all these pieces together. So we'll, we'll be working to help the board understand all of your options as we move into this capital project. What do you think is a good number, Gary? And this is maybe not a fair um, kind of extemporaneous question, but what do you think is a fair amount to sort of just have as our I don't want to say safety net as a county, but it's not that different from your household budget. Yeah. Like you should have three months of uh, bills at yeah. the ready plus an emergency fund. So well, I always think four or five million personally. Yeah, for my is personal right. account. Yeah. So, no, not for your personal, obviously, but for the county. Uh, so most localities. Dear diary. <laughs> most localities um, do this based on their fund balance number. 
which is defined as the is that a, a mound at June 30th, right. which is kind of kind of the right side of this chart. Um, but that's a, a really meaningless number in reality. It's really that low cash right. period. And many, many localities have the kind of double hump because they collect taxes twice a year. Right. We do it once a year. Uh, and so our valley is a little bit deeper than if we did it twice a year. Um, so the answer is I'm not going to answer. And uh, Bonnie and I will eventually we'll, we'll get Bonnie there. and I will definitely make a recommendation. And I think what we should probably do is be um, getting some input from someone like Davenport and company who do this for a living and make those recommendations. And most localities do have these policies that, you know, debt capacity policies on just how much debt that you will allow yourselves to get into that are measured on assessed value or total expenditures or any number of metrics. Uh, but also how much you want to have is that cushion that is not designated to anything. Right. That is the, the kind of the rainy day in case something weird happens at the wrong time. Um, we went through a pandemic. We all thought it was doom and gloom. We ended up better than we would have otherwise. Who would have ever guessed that? So there, but there is a, a rainy day out there where it is the other way around. Um, and we yeah, just need sure. to be able to plan for that. I, so, oh, I'm sorry, you go. Okay. I, I, so I th we've talked about this before and I'm really excited that we're moving into talking about it more. When can we expect to have some actionable information to move off of so that we can go properly into this courthouse uh, endeavor with all of this information in front of us. I mean, I feel, I mean, this is critical. And I know that we've had this discussion. Sure. I'm just wondering about the timeline here. Yeah, and I think it's most important that, um, well, uh, no one would say cost is not a factor in a courthouse. Obviously, you want to have a budget and constrain yourself to a budget. But what you need in a structure that will last the right amount of time, it's these two things pulling against each other, a Venn diagram, and somewhere there's a, a sweet spot. And so we do need some information to help us get to that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I agree um, that is the case, um, but I don't. I don't. I haven't talked to Bonnie recently enough about this to know that whether she'll be talking about it in the budget or after the budget. It's a separate thing. Yeah. Okay. But it's really it comes down to. It, to me, it seems like it, there are two key variables. One would be cash position. Yep. Um, think about it. Think about it in terms of putting a down payment on your house, and then it's debt capacity, carrying capacity for debt, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, I. Sorry, I had a oh, question oh, on sorry. the graph. Yep. Uh, so two questions, and I don't know. You're usually pretty good. I'm going to put you on the spot. You're usually pretty good at knowing the answer to these types of questions. So we'll see. Um, the August, timing. So August. <laughs> Quiz August, ball. <laughs> August of 2023, okay. our, our cash on hand fell below the prior fiscal year, which is odd to me because you can see the graph. Otherwise. This is 24, actually, this, this square right here. It's 2024. Yeah. yeah. So if you see... And the reason it dipped down is because we delayed the bills, the tax bills. Yeah. Um, and so you delay the money coming in the door, you dip deeper into the pocket. So what month was that? This is August. So if you look down here, you can see. Was that because the state hadn't come up with their budget yet? There was some reason. Right, but yeah, it was. It just took longer. I know it was year. 24 fiscal year. That's what I'm saying. But it was, it was August of 23, right? It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right. So yeah. exactly, and so the reason that happened is because, remember we were talking about, uh, do we need to raise taxes? We not need to raise taxes. There's some oh, yeah, take, yeah. Okay. and we said, let's just slow down. Let's okay. hold, hold yeah, yeah. normally want to, let's get the bills out so, so we get was, the cash rolling. Yeah. So that was the consequences we tried to wrestle with the school budget gap. Yeah. Okay, then my second question is, I think it's February of, um, Yes, exactly. What happened there? So when you see big bumps like that, I can't speak to that exactly. It's okay. likely a, a, 
a large infusion of money, ARPA payment or that's something was, like that. That's what I was wondering. Yep. Um, but I don't have a yeah, look at so it. you know things like that. You know, there's probably CARES and ARPA. Because that would have been that would have been February 2023. And we got that in two tranches. So we'd have to go back and look, but it was probably a big infusion of cash for some reason. So more likely that than this. This a bump up in the chart would be. An infusion of cash or a much less okay. lower than normal expenditure. Yeah, it's, it's unlikely just, that it's the latter. It's just wild because, like, on that first question, I mean, that just jumps out. It's like, well, what happened? Because that year upon year, we've been improving our cash position yeah. while being mindful of not oversaving to Miss Smith's point, like, how much is too much? Yeah, and you can see the in. difference between kind of this belly and then yep. this is when we really start to accelerate getting the bills out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Out. Sorry to belabor that. Sorry to push you off of it. Um, <laughs> I barely felt it. I just realized I, <laughs> I didn't plug my computer, so it's, uh -oh. it's down here. I just need to, pardon me. Please hold. Yeah. Technical support. Good thing the battery's good. The one thing I noticed, and I'm probably wrong, but it looked like under revenue for interest for the month of February. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exciting. We oh, made $63,663 yeah, no in doubt. interest. Uh, so, you're, um, so let's go back to that other chart, right? So you're holding, you're holding uh, $15.5 million right now. That earns a lot of interest. Yep. You have to hold a lot of money now because you're not going to get any more money until you send tax bills out again. Yep. Uh, so this is the time of year we really rake in interest. Uh, so the interest rates are up, and you're at your highest cash point in the year. Yep. That's uh, great. When you go back a few years, we were making nothing, practically, right? I see Treasurer Nick is on, and I just yeah. want to say thank you again for yeah, she does putting our money job. where we need to put it. Yep. There is still $100,000 in interest over in uh, Warren County banks on the broadband money. Just it is. Uh, so that, sell, uh, sell earn an interest. On that one. And they told us that we couldn't, and now we are, so thank it's you lovely. very much. They sent it back. <laughs> uh, I did have conversations with them about that. How were they going to uh, <coughs> ahead and plan for it? And their response was uh, they wanted to be consistent, and they think what they're going to do is send uh, end-of-year disbursements as opposed to just credited against one of our payments. Oh, good. So everybody can have well, the same or not, or we've the same process. Otherwise, it gets too confusing. Because I think it was like $86,000 in interest last year from funds on deposit over there. But that wasn't all... No, so, that's our money. You no, know, that's our money, but it keeps our balance keeps growing, and the interest rate is good. And so, yeah, that's yeah. Well, on the economic statement, it breaks out the yes. in, year to date interest, yes. and it was like eighty six thousand dollars last year. That but sounds about right. In terms of the configuration of the escrow account, though, presumably all the parties that paid into it uh, are separately. Our out. our money is on a our own bank account. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think they finally realized that this was this interest was going to be an issue, and they just separated everybody into their own bank account okay. so they could be easily tracked separately. Yep. Can they send it now? Uh, well. <laughs> well. <laughs> An IOU in this business is nearly as good as having it in your pocket. Okay. Keep burning interest on the interest. I'll keep, I'll keep track of it. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. I do want to point out in the county administrator reports, if you're ready to move on. Sure. Uh, I did download data from your... Um, yes. Your post-mounted speed display signs. Here's a wrapping news headline coming up. <laughs> it's, there's a, there are many, there's just a ton of data, right? Every, there's a data point for every vehicle that goes by, and so it's just overwhelming amount of data. So there's a few different ways you can boil it down. Uh, so there's a series of charts I tried to have kind of consistent. If you look on the chart on the kind of upper left, it tells you which sign this is. So this is Route 522 northbound Woodville. Okay, so that's uh, where it goes from 55 to 35. Um, so these are uh, those that are going 15 miles an hour or higher, their average and peak speed. So as you can imagine, as you're driving towards this sign, you see it start flashing a very big number, you start slowing down. Uh, maybe you slow down to 35 by the time you get to the sign, maybe you don't. So the peak speed is the peak speed, and the average is it's as they're slowing down, hmm. right? So you can see um, 
These are counts of cars on these dates that their peak and average speed exceeded 15 miles an hour over the 35 miles an hour. All right. Now, the speed limit is not 35 until you get to the sign, so it is not necessarily a violation in that location. They could have slowed down to 35 by the time it passed the sign. Just want to make that clear. So what does the green line represent? That's the average. Oh, okay. And so the red is the peak. So you can see there's a lot of cars leading up to that sign that are going more than 15 over 35. Okay. Uh, and now you can see their peak speeds. <laughs> the peak speed recorded on those days, 81 miles an hour, 82 miles an hour, approaching the sign in Woodville. And as somebody who lives on that road, <laughs> 100 yards from that 81 miles an hour right there, yep. I can hear it yeah. inside my house. So just showing and all the residents of Woodville can. Uh, the lowest peak speed on any day over these kind of three weeks was 68. Peak, fastest car that day. The lowest peak speed. The fastest car that day. I wonder, I was trying to be charitable while reviewing these numbers and think the best of people. And I did wonder if some of this could be emergency response at certain times. Should be, yep. Yep. Certainly possible. Yeah, I have the same but thought. But then I do wonder if there's people that out there that are just trying to get high score on the new machine. But no. Well, <laughs> I, so the signs, the machines are programmed so that they won't give you a high score. It just gives you dashes. If, well, if you get over a certain amount, oh, it good. doesn't display the speed. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, anecdotally, since it's northbound, you know, yeah. first responders speed through town going the other way. Yeah, that's it's true. It's always southbound. I mean, it does happen to rarely the other way, but it's usually from Sperryville. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was There's only one sign in this I mean, entire batch that really uh, shows the violators, and that's in Flint Hill because it's within the speed zone. Right. Right? Uh, so then some histograms showing you a peak speed again of just how fast people are going. So most people are going 51 to 55 as they approach that sign. Eh, maybe that makes sense, right? It's a, they're in a 55 zone heading into a 35. Um, and some people are going really slow. Maybe they must have just turned out of a driveway. And then you can see that for each week. And I'm not going to. Wait, so is that an average or is that a. This is, this is the peak speed. Okay, peak. Yeah. Okay. 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 I see. I see. That's really pretty consistent. Okay. So now let's uh, 522 northbound Sperryville. This would be next to the pseudo driving range, right? Yeah. Um, and so again, uh, same metric, or at least 15 miles an hour. Where these vehicles approaching the 25 are in a 45 mile an hour zone, right? I believe. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they right. should slow down to 25 at that right. sign. So, so not so, that shocking that their approach is not that is, shocking. Okay. Yep. However, the peak speeds. <laughs> yeah. 91. 91. So, uh, sorry, it's sideways here. But you have so, a photo of the vehicle? No, uh, people keep asking. So that was between 11.30 and 11.45 on that Friday. Someone was going 91. Yeah. We need to call dispatch. Yeah. Can you check this date and time? Yeah. And then on uh, this, and so, you know, the data is so grand. You can dig in. It's just overwhelming, right, the amount of data. So this so one was, I can't make it. Paid. So these are, this is all off the permanent science, right? No. Yeah. Okay. We can do it off the other ones. It just gets to be overwhelming. Yeah. So you can see again here. Most cars are going 41 to 45 as they approach that summer. Most people want to comply. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, there's these 515 that are going 51 to 55. We just don't yeah. care. Right. Well, so, you can... right. um, so Route 522 southbound in Flint Hill. That's coming from Chester Gap. And uh, they should be slowed down. They're in a 35 mile an hour zone. Right. So these are the people going at least 15 miles an hour over in that. So it's quite a few people. Peak speed, 70. In the village. In the yeah, village. This is on the, Which, uh, right the north Settles. side of the packing shed. Yeah, right yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're cruising on in. Yeah. What time yeah. of night was uh, it? Yeah. This, these aren't paying. These aren't. They're yeah. not behaving. There you go. This was between 8.30 and 8.45. Oh, between 6.45 and 7 p.m. Crazy. So that's the fast side of town, no doubt. Uh, and then you can see generally people are going 31 to 35. That actually made me feel better. Yeah. 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 Now, there's yeah, people. 10 people going 61 plus. Yeah. Uh, 522 northbound Flint Hill. This is within the 25. So you've already passed the 25 mile an hour zone when you come up kind of at the hill. And then, so you're soundly in a 25 mile an hour zone at this point in time. So you have this number of people 
exceeding the speed limit by 15 miles an hour wow. at that middle of kind of town location. That's a lot. Uh, but peak speeds are a much more reasonable 65. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But every day, the lowest is 51. That's why we're losing businesses right off of 522. The lowest peak speed, right? So yeah, it's yeah, an outlier yeah. of that day. Yeah. People are going fast. I know the residents of Flint Hill will appreciate that you're being proven right. And so you can see most people are going 36, 26 to 30. Yeah. Uh, but you have the, you know, the really speeders. I mean, that's There's a, a seven in the 61. I mean, 46, speed. 46 and above. I mean, that's, all, that's quite a bit of cars. It's almost 200 cars. Yeah. In a 25 mile an hour yeah, zone. Yeah, 25, going above 46 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> for for this, the temporary sign out um, near Baldwin's gas station. I could download that, yeah. Could we, I mean, I don't know, could we get a permanent one there? Because it's getting good reviews. Um, Everybody we can it. ask. Okay. We can ask. Okay. And then we can move that temporary one back down to Sperryville, please. Uh, so I've only got the four signs. Um, uh, Mr. Jenkins fixed a solar power issue at the one closest to the National Park this morning. So um, okay. ready for spring. It's perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there was an issue with the solar panel not charging the battery. And uh, so the battery didn't last about two weeks. That's <laughs> great. And uh, so, But now it's, it's back. So... Um, it's a kind of a pain to pull all this data, and there's a thousand charts you could look at. Uh, you hear about from VDOT, the 85th percentile, so that it pulls all that information. So when it's time to um, ask VDOT to put a, ask for them for a permanent sign at the Baldwin's location, for example, or at the uh, Sperryville location across from the golf course, putting a temporary sign then there, pulling the data and showing so them the this data might be able to show them the value okay. of, of okay. doing it. Um, so right now, uh, the temporary ones are on Main Street, Baldwin's, and then down at Viewtown Road, where it changes to 35 miles an hour. I've not pulled data from either of those yet. Sure, it's no, kind of sort of makes I, speed bumps more interesting now. And I saw another <laughs> traffic speed and mitigation um, device on Viewtown Road named uh, Deputy Jenkins Good. the other day. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I wonder what those numbers will be. I bet they'll be. That's probably high. That's crazy town yeah. down there. Yeah. Probably high. Uh, and so uh, when I was in Arizona, they had speed tables everywhere, which is kind of a speed hump bump uh, higher. It, yeah, yeah. You slow down. <coughs> slow down. Yep. Now, it is in the traffic calming bucket for VDOT, yeah. but VDOT is very restricted on where they allow you to do that I've stuff. Never seen that. Thank you for doing all that. I think those things very can have unintended yeah. consequences. Yep. Especially with people hauling, I mean, I imagine hauling horses and any kind of oh, stuff yeah. like that, it'd be terrible. That's why they, they restrict them to yeah. neighborhoods mostly, so. Yeah. Um, would, was there any, uh, I would, did not keep up on that legislation where they were going to allow localities. I'll have to Campus. check back into that. I don't know, I doubt they would get through the governor, but um, there was some legislation to open up where localities can put speed enforced cameras which now is construction zones and school zones. The sheriff has started working with Thanks, a firm Thanks, that does that for our school zone. So that's happening for our school zone? No, I mean, there's, the just, there's some preliminary analysis and mo measurements have been taken, um, but I don't know where she is on that. It has to be, the sheriff and the county have to be involved. So she's... But those talks are happening. Yeah. Interesting. For uh, both school zones? Uh, well, there are limitations in how far away from the school, and so they both might not be eligible. because um, oh, the elementary Yeah, but this new law could change that, who knows. Um, and it only is pertinent when the school zone is flashing and on. Right. And the sheriff was relating that one of her peers in, I uh, can't remember the county, basically caused the flashing lights to be on all day. Kids are in school, it's on all day. And... Uh, it's probably a revenue generator on two eleven. Amen. <laughs> so legal matters. Um, uh, just obviously, the board is aware that uh, you, you were victorious in the Supreme Court relative to the appeal of the special exception. <laughs> so that is excellent. Um, Mr. Goff and myself and Ms. Summers have been in discussions on what's next relative to the enforcement case for all of this, which was parallel. Exactly. <laughs> 
That's four years. It's, it's four a process. Years. Yeah. Um, um, the board denied this particular application um, over a year ago. It's eligible to reapply. Um, yeah, it was March 2020. Um, you have the two Flint Hill cases. Uh, the, the best of my knowledge, the appeals court has not set any dates. Uh, I checked on it when I released the agenda. I haven't looked at it in the last couple of days. Uh, there's the second case. Um, and as I noted, Bay Corp have assigned the same attorney for this, which makes a lot of sense. Yes, thank goodness. Uh, Caparuccio is still mired, um, as uh, Mr. Goff and I warned a long time ago. This is about family, family dynamics and difficulties in that family. And um, the citizens forced the hand and brought it to court, but it didn't resolve anything. We still have family dynamics causing problems. So we're hopeful that that will get resolved. And... The sister will um, take care of the site as soon as she can actually control it. Uh, Mr. Stevens' report wasn't on here earlier. It, it's now on here. It is. Good. And somehow I did not attach the VDOT report. I definitely got it, so I will add that. Um, after the meeting. Okay. Is Mr. Nesbitt going to touch on the, um, the safety report metrics that he presented to us next year or last year at next month's meeting? I thought he said something at the last meeting about um, bringing those to us soon. He was going to do an annual report and he, they've been looking at ways to invest the CSOI funds maybe, which is safety funds. Um, but he will be at the May meeting okay. uh, for a, a quarterly update and the public hearings. Great. So if there's something in specific that I'm not, it's not, what you're saying is not coming to mind. If you find something, just remind me. I'll go back and look for that report. It was very instructive. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Matters presented by the board. <clears throat> Ms. Comer. Ms. Smith. Oh, I already asked for the affordable housing study, um, so I, I can't, nothing comes to mind. Maybe give me a moment, please. Mr. Whitson. I just wanted to extend my condolences to the uh, family of John Anderson, mm -hmm. uh, who died recently, obviously a true native son of Rapana County and uh, someone who uh, was very generous in, in uh, assisting with various county causes and uh, attended the funeral on Saturday, it was quite incredible to see the uh, outpouring of support for his legacy and his family. So I wanted to mention that. Thank you. Mr. Carney? Um, I wanted to bring up that uh, as we go over the ordinance, uh, revisions and tidying up and stuff, I wanted to kind of ask you all how you felt about uh, perhaps getting some outside legal counsel um, and I'm specifically thinking of, if it's possible, uh, Ms. Pandek, um, if she frees herself up from the BZA, which I think has engaged with her recently. Um, just because, you know, this process is going to be, um, it's intense. And I think that we just need to make sure that we have uh, just, you know, all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted and such. So I just wanted to, to kind of talk about that as we go through it and see what you guys you know, well, if the BZA has retained Ms. Pandek, I think we would be well served to retain someone else in the event there's ever a conflict. Oh, I, I just meant if she released, not she can't do it if she's with them, right? Just if they're done with her, and then, but it doesn't matter, it could be somebody else. I well, I mean, I think there was that matter in Kriglersville that didn't go the county's way, too, that she was uh, recently involved in. So, I would, I would personally prefer someone else, okay? But just generally, conceptually. Speaking. Yeah. yeah, conceptually speaking. I was just talking about broadly legal counsel. Yeah. For this, for this, that that, and I don't know how it works. I don't know how if we retain somebody, if the planning commission, um, how that would work. But I, I just I feel the need for. Yeah, I mean, art. It might make sense for art to put out feelers. Uh, generally, uh, the uh, legal services is not beholden to the public procurement act because they probably wrote the public procurement act. So um, you don't have to do RFPs or any of that stuff for lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's no um, 
hoops to jump through from that perspective, uh, but we would just want to understand if you want staff to go beat uh, the streets for people who might have an expertise in this area to assist, um, we would want to know what we're empowered to do uh, because that led to a hornet's nest in the past. What's that? Seeking illegal services led to a hornet's nest in the past. Uh, yes, it did. That would be called brag one. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, we just want to know exactly what we're empowered to do yep. before we do anything. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's just the general was the general idea. It's not specific to Ms. Pendek at all. It's yeah. more about just should we do this? And I think that we probably should or at least keep our eye on it. So you're saying that you would need a motion or something? If you want us to identify people who might be um, willing and um, have proper expertise, I think a motion to ask Art and I to go find a pool of candidates would be Okay, well then I'll make that helpful. motion. Okay. Uh, I'm, Can I ask oh, this? Hold on. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, is, do, would you mind if we just ask Art to what's the what's this person's job supposed to be? Zoning. Like, for instance, as we move through this process with redoing our ordinance, we're going to have questions. So this is going to be like a consulting yeah. attorney mm -hmm. with expertise in zoning. In zoning. Specifically, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's going to be an hourly thing. Is Th this is just why I wanted to bring this up. I, I I wanted to just put it out there, and I I'm not suggesting that we need to. Uh, we don't even need to take action right now. It's more just that I, I just wanted to get the conversation going, and it's really about I, I don't yeah. know. Would it be that, or would it be, you know, uh, uh, we need to talk about a budget and all that kind of stuff. It's just that we are currently redoing our zoning ordinance, and you have a lot on your plate. And we need to make sure that we have our bases covered as we move through this. I know when we so started talking about the Berkeley group, I, and I bet you did here as well, thought they had a zoning yeah. legal they expert do. on there. And they use Pandek. They, that's, I talked to Drew in Richmond, and he oh. said, we can get you Sharon Pandek. And I said, well, we kind of sort of already have her. Um, so we'll have to talk about right. this. You certainly but, don't want to pay Berkeley group a, a market. Retainer, fee. yeah. No, yeah. I told Drew we'd. Um, we'd be able to handle that. But um, I just think from people that I've talked to anyway, you got RLEP hiring a lawyer. I've heard of another group that might be hiring a lawyer. I would much rather have a lawyer that... Well, we have a lawyer. Well, <laughs> zoning specific, sorry. Okay. Um, that would be our, our go-to person that other people wouldn't have to spend the money on a zoning attorney. Uh, your interests are not always going to be aligned with those other True. groups. And, um, that's why independent counsel is important. Yeah, but so in this process, Art, you might have some instances where you might, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but appreciate a little outside help where we can say, hey, just we need X, we need Y. I, I'm not thinking that we need to. Give me an assistant county attorney for zoning, and maybe then they could become a, uh, a county employer where like a when I started out, I just billed the county. I was assistant county attorney, and I just billed an hourly rate. I believe it was $150 an hour. And then just have them report to me and Gary, and then to the board. That's just a suggestion to kind of put, uh, I guess, uh, maybe a circle around or a fence around what they're supposed to do. And have some direct supervision that's extremely responsive to the board. Because you, know, you know, I serve with your pleasure. So, you know, and Gary tasks me, so this could also extend to that mm -hmm. that person with the title. I'm just throwing that out. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, that's. I think that's why you raised it, is to talk yeah, through yeah. Yep. how we would, how we could approach it. But yeah. I think we all agree. If anything matters in Rapan County, it's zoning. Absolutely. And no doubt, um, we're looking at compliance with the Code of Virginia through the ongoing work of the Planning Commission of the Berkeley Group. So that was a key objective of all that effort because of the sign ordinance question and the constitutionality of our, our now far out of date sign ordinance. So we definitely conceptually have been taking steps through the Berkeley Group to make sure our ordinance aligns with the Code of Virginia. But I think also, um, and recent events have brought this into the spotlight, you know, where, where might we need, um, help? 
So, I mean, whether we take action on this or not, I, I appreciate the, at least conversation. the conversation. Maybe we just think about it. and Maybe what we should do is then just have it as an agenda item for next month and we can kind of cogitate on it and just okay. come back. And that makes sense. Good idea. I, I hope that everyone knows how very critical our zoning strength is to me and I think paramount to the people of Rappahannock County. I'm just going to also say that we keep spending money on staff and jockeying people around and you know everything comes nothing we do is for free everything comes at a cost so if we are thinking of taking on additional staff or additional um, uh, advisory type positions even if they're temporary mm. we need to be mindful of being specific in our approach and completing it on a task basis so that we're not creating positions, permanent positions for temporary yeah. issues or needs. Because I think there is a real danger of that. And I hear and understand and agree with the concerns over expertise uh, on planning and zoning. And it is very much a niche legal background. Um, and our other uh, challenge is always finding someone who understands our county and that we're almost trying to counter engineer what everyone else does. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, trying to get all of those things to align we just need to be specific yeah. in our approach. Well, sir, I agree. Um, I agree. I do hear and agree with the cry for additional legal uh, interpretation or uh, review of our ordinance to make sure it's sound. And what we find ourselves in with the BZA is an unfortunate situation. And, and with that, with that situation in general, it's unfortunate that we that uh, we find ourselves in this position. Um, however, we can't anticipate every right. situation. It's, it's impossible to anticipate how things will unfold, how things would be interpreted, and certainly things can sometimes have uh, ramifications that were never anticipated when they were adopted. So I, I, I do think it is something we need to look at. I think we'll need to be very careful with our selection. Yeah, I okay. totally agree. And I, I really only brought up in the context of this document is now, though it has been amended and updated, almost 40 years old. And I think, Ms. Smith, you brought it up, I can't remember when, but a while ago that this is a pretty big deal. It is a big be, deal. Doing it. So it's really only in that context that I'm thinking about this and saying, okay, you know, we, we need to be uh, make sure that we're we're covered. But I agree with you that we should be surgical about it. And um, yeah, so um, just you should remember, Falk here has a, a, a planning uh, staff of twenty people, <laughs> and that was five years ago. So it's probably more than that now. So why don't we just take their ordinance? And <laughs> yeah. We don't want their ordinance. <laughs> We're going to talk about that tonight. Get trouble on that so I'll, I <laughs> made a note to have an agenda item next month to talk about this more okay. fully. Thank you. And, uh, so we we might bounce around some ideas, but we're not going to certainly yeah, yeah. take any action. Yeah, ideas, and yeah. then we can continue talking about it and see where we get. The only thing I have is the reminder of the spring swing um, event at Company 4 on March 23rd. From 7 to 7.30, there's going to be an instructor, That's so good. you can get some lesson. And then from 7.30 to 9, uh, there's the dance, and there'll be munchies available and non-alcoholic beverages and stuff is like that. Is so it a swing dance? It is a swing oh, dance. Nine, the, it'll be physical therapy. Spring. <laughs> and the ambulance will be right there. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's all I have. What What is, um, I, and I just don't mean to interrupt, but someone did ask me earlier, and I don't, I honestly didn't know the answer. What is, what is the anticipated uh content of the meeting tomorrow the what clearing, the clearing? Uh, it's uh, facilitated discussions regarding the uh, affirmations and challenges and uh, 
group-led discussion, uh, presumably on how we can communicate in ways that help us move towards solutions to those challenges. Okay. Group, group defined solutions, I think, is the and outcome. What time is uh, tomorrow? Three o'clock. So are we, we're at the base? Yes. yes. And we're in the big room, I'm assuming? We're in the room all the way on the left, where the board work session Well, that's was. not going to be big enough. Um, so that's, that's the room we're at in. The certain, Everybody the two per company yeah. at the table and yep. then chairs. Okay. okay. All right, uh, recess until 7. Uh, did you have anything else? You were no, that's okay. it. Thank you, though. I appreciate it, Gary. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Okay.